four, three, two, one, we're live. This is 2OF Entertainment. Welcome to the Lost Dollar Business Club, where we talk about business, 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 and not just business. We talk about what makes businesses go up and what makes businesses go down. If you're interested in businesses, this is what it is. We talk about the global economy. We talk about global politics. We talk about everything and anything business related that affects your life on a global scale as well as a local scale. And don't miss after the show, Lost and Found. Um, we're back. I, yes, I, I don't know if you like that new opening. It looks like Sesame Street did it, but I, I oh, but yeah, we, we gotta keep, we're, we're always playing around, experimenting, and uh, but look at these new backgrounds we have. Look at this new. I know, uh, my, he's, he's done good. Right. David's done good. This is what happens it, when you let David alone for a while. He does. That's, things, that's so. what happened. That's what. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. New logo. Well, before for the fans that are watching. There's only two of us today, and the reason is is because we have two special guests with us that Michael's going to go into in a second. So we figured instead of having the entourage, you would be stuck with us and our guests. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. next week we have Guy Standing coming back for you guys that love Guy. No, Michael Collins first. Sorry, and and Guy's after. And then Guy Standing is coming back because you guys yeah. love his content so much, and rightfully so. Very, Very rich good. conversation all about the economy, so we'll talk about both of those in the coming weeks. There you go. And if we have time, we'll do Lost and Found. If not, it's this will be an exciting interview. Michael, who are our guests that we're going to be bringing in in a second? So we've, we've got Huro AI. And, uh, you know, it's one of our favorite topics is AI, but we're going to yeah. get a completely different viewpoint from what I can understand on AI uh, from Cheryl and Jim. And we've got the CEO and the CTO. So that's very exciting to have Huro AI well represented. And, uh, why don't we bring them in and uh, and get started? And as we as we bring them in, what is their slogan? They're going to do what? That's right. Hero AI wants to bring quantum AI into every home, and here they there are. There you go. And welcome to the show. So we're going to get explanations on what quantum AI is and uh, why we want it in every home. But we'll start off. Cheryl, Jim, thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, oh, really nice. exciting. I mean, the so AI. Yeah, go, well, we, we, we've, the AI space has been really exciting, obviously, for a lot of reasons. But you guys have a, a different approach, which makes it even more exciting to talk about. So why don't you just pitch us for a moment and just give us the top level view of what Hero AI is about to do. Gosh. Well, we want to bring quantum AI into every home. And at the end of the day, to put it quite simply, we want you to be able to pick up your phone or speak to your fridge or your computer and be able to communicate with anyone in the world and to able to trade and connect with them as well. Okay, so the the what you're trying to solve is it is is it just the translation situation because couldn't we just pick up Google Translate and uh, do it that way? You know, Mike, that's a great point there. And no, that's not the only uh, area that we're going to stop at. But that is the first step in okay. building a super AI. Can you right. talk about that, though? Because yeah. I'm not excited that you can I can translate. That's OK. Big deal. What are you going to do? Like, tell me why I'm I'm want to use Hero AI, because I don't I, right now. I don't know why I'd want to use it. I pick up my phone and what happens? Tell me why you're better than everybody else, or you're the only ones out there. Tell us why that. that yeah, we're going to get into that. Well, first of all, their quantum doesn't even truly exist today. I mean, there's lots of companies that's trying to create quantum right. computing, but uh, that that's already a feat in itself. But super AI itself is a whole other story. So if you think of what LLM is today, that's not truly super AI. Uh, and Jim over here, my CTA can, can actually tell you more about what true super AI is right. and uh, be able to give, the, give you the differentiators there. Um, <clears throat> but essentially, the, the, our, our core differentiator between us and all the other LLMs, whether it's, you know, ChatGPT or whether it's uh, Google or whether it's uh, Microsoft that's building their own form of AGI, our core difference is really the human to human communication aspect. What we've discovered in building our super AI is that you can't teach AI just based off of one flat, one dimensional sources of data. 
And what Which I mean you, by that. You're referencing language. Right. And what I mean by that is uh, you can't boil us humanity down into articles or Excel spreadsheets or PowerPoint. You and I were having a conversation today on, you know, this uh, podcast and the way we speak to each other, the tone that we speak to each other with, the words that we use. For example, you and I come from entirely different backgrounds. Maybe I was born in a village. Maybe you were born in a, met a metropolitan city. Maybe you're uh, born in Saudi Arabia and I'm from China. You know, the color red to me means an entirely different thing to you, for example. Uh, down to our profession as well. You know, what you went to school uh, studying in university, or even if you finished high school, did you finish GED? <clears throat> so those tiny little differences is what makes us so unique. It's the essence of who we are as human beings. And what we have done in training, you know, LLMs the way we are now in the way that, you know, uh, ChatGPT or all the other LLMs are doing out there, we have essentially said, you know, let's throw out what humanity is truly about and reduce us down into just binary data. And that's not us. There's so much more color to us. Jim, you want to go ahead and talk about the quantum side of things? Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> so even on in quantum computing, just as with AI, there's a lot of dispute even among the expert researchers in this realm as to what quantum computing even looks like. Uh, many initiatives over the years involved uh, qubits. And, and you may recall hearing words like this, right? Qubits or quantum dots or quantum this or quantum that. In many respects, quantum computing went through the very same cycle that AI is currently going through, where it's overhyped, unusual expectations, unreal expectations in some cases. And rather than deliver on what was originally promised, there is a tendency in the tech world to settle on second best. And, and we're not about that uh, at all. Uh, the, the view we have of quantum computing uh, is uh, quite orthogonal, if you will, to uh, the entire initiatives that were launched by IBM, Intel, uh, and others. Because uh, we're not trying to slow a, an individual photon, and we're not trying to measure the many states of a potential photon as it's frozen at very low temperatures. Because in many respects, that's fool's folly. What matters is satisfying a customer need. And I couldn't see a way that isolating a single photon was going to help me satisfy customer need. So the quantum computing we have developed is based on customer need. And it really was a customer requirements that gave us focus in trying to zero in on how we actually build it. Because I have to have a system that will crank out 4 million connections per second all day long. 24-7, 365. That's impossible to do with propagation delays on the digital side. I'll be quiet. So, no, that's great. I mean, you've got, <laughs> you don't have to go a little bit deeper into it because it sounds like we talked on the last call, just as a precursor to this interview, um, you've got patents. And this company, Huro AI, has patents, patented technology. So can you share a little bit about that and give us some of the framework that makes this a different technology than anything else? that's out there. Uh, because when you talk about quantum differentiation, you know, what, what did you develop that's very different in the quantum space? Uh, we developed uh, a processor infrastructure uh, that will operate uh, basically half as fast as the fastest device in it. I, I come from a networking background. So anything that slows traffic down is a pain in the butt. And uh, that's our enemy. And so uh, the, the circuit as designed is a flow through uh, for processing. Uh, mm -hmm. So why only half of the fastest device? Because I have to divide everything by two to get an average on the quantum side. Okay. And so uh, knowing this, uh, all I need to know is what's the next generation of network devices? What are their speeds? Because once we implement our quantum processor infrastructure, uh, it goes as fast as the network does. 
So, so the potential for terahertz processing is within Hero AI's horizon. So, you know, let me let me give a little bit of a background here as well, Mike yeah. and Steve. Uh, you know, let's really kind of drill it down to what people really want, right? Because when people really think about uh, speed of processing, do they really care about whether it's quantum or not? When they think about super AI, do they really care whether it's really based on human to human communications or not? I mean, at the end of the day, we just want the damn thing to work and work right. as fast as possible and immediately be able to help, you know, improve our lives as much as possible. And so, you know, in building this super AI, we had lots of challenges. And uh, one of the challenges is, for example, energy consumption today. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, there's, you know, based on the numbers that Jim over here has crunched, uh, open AI, for example, um, uses about enough energy to power 32 EV cars per prompt. Uh, those were really shocking numbers. <clears throat> uh, our, you know, we have to figure out how to make AI sustainable. If everybody wants it in their lives, how do we then create a sustainable AI? And not only that, how do we make sure nobody is left behind? That to me is an even uh, more important question. How, so do we, how do we level the playing field? for everyone across the world so that AI is accessible to everyone. And when I say everyone, I don't mean just us working class, you know, middle-aged people. I'm talking about grandma who doesn't know how to download an app and use, you know, ChatGPT. How do we make it accessible for her? Well, can you tell us how, you, how, how do you do that? Because right. if you're not downloading an app or you're not using, you know, Chat's web interface, how does it work? How do we use it? Well, <laughs> so this was a really interesting and, and difficult challenge that was posed to Jim, you know, and when we, when Jim and I first got together, not too long ago, maybe a year ago, um, the challenge was, well, how do we make it accessible to everyone across the, the, uh, the world, including people who are uh, still on 2G or 3G? Or even a rotary phone. I don't even know if they exist anymore, but people with satellites. Well, They're out there. You know, the, the people with satellites, um, but not, you know, uh, Wi Fi. How do we get those? How do we get the, the continent of Africa on board? Because there's cable all around the outskirts, but nothing on the in. So, how do we serve the world of people and make sure? a huge percentage of people is not left behind. And uh, some of our patents, in fact, six patents now uh, actually, you know, target this problem area. We, our super AI is going to be inserted into connectivity systems. And what I mean by that is telecoms, satellites, mm, okay. uh, VWAP, Bluetooth. These are all connectivity systems. So at the end of the day, we envision a future where you no longer need apps because you have a super agent. You know, the world's crazy about agents nowadays, but what we have patented is the boss agent. It's it's we literally call her the boss agent. <laughs> it's the boss that tells all the other agents what to do. And so you can imagine, just think of this as if uh, you are the CEO of a thousand agent company. And every single agent is doing something for you, right? Whether it's doing social media marketing, whether it's uh, running, you know, your accounting department, paying bills, so on mm -hmm. and so forth. So you have a thousand of these. Well, you need a boss agent in which you yourself, Mike, can interact with this boss agent and just tell the boss agent what to do. And the boss agent just goes to do. And we want to insert this into telecoms so that you can at the end of the day, be able to call, say, Verizon or AT&T or Vodafone, whoever it is. And it's as simple as activating your cable. Hey, turn on uh, my super AI, which we call Gabby, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, our affectionate name for her is Gabby. <clears throat> so turn Gabby on. Is that an acronym? 
Uh, it is. It's generative adaptive business intelligence. Okay. All right. Got it. So what does Gabby do now? I picked up. You know, I've picked up the phone yep. and I'm making this phone call and I say, "Turn on my Gabby." And now I'm going to call somebody in. I'm. Uh, I speak English. I'm going to call now somebody that speaks any one of the seven thousand languages out there. Now what happens? Because now you're in the telco, right? You're in the satellites. So now I'm going to make a phone call and I'm going to call so and so who speaks, say, Mandarin or whatever. What happens? So uh, remember I was talking about the essence of a being, the essence of mm -hmm. every single one of us. Uh, we call it the language of us or the language of you. And so what we want to do here is not just translate word for word. Let's go a few steps further than that because the essence of us is important. That's what makes my words different than yours. The way you speak and I speak and the meaning behind what we say is so different because of who we are. And so. Uh, we have Gabby in the middle. Imagine Gabby as this black box that's able to essentially take what I mean, the essence of everything that I'm saying, and translate into the essence of what you derive the meaning to be so that you understand it in the way you um, have grown up, in the way you have lived. You would understand what I'm saying in the same sort of way, if that makes sense. The, the whole the whole open when you say black box you just got the ire of the entire open source community right, right. so I'm gonna ask on their behalf so what do you do about the ethics and security of this Gabby being the center of of all of this I mean how why should why should the world the telecoms trust her OAI I'll That's take that yeah yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't really have a choice in this Mike uh, each country has their own rules for data protection and data security. Mm -hmm. uh, we adhere to what those countries want us to do. For us to inject our individual biases and predispositions uh, is doesn't it's not acceptable to the countries that we're talking to. Mm -hmm. They want their rules and their rules only. Right. And so we don't feel inclined to dictate to them what they should do. Okay, so you're following the laws of each of each company that you're interacting with, and presumably the, the black box is going to follow the law. So That's exactly right. Well, and not only that as well, I'm going to take it a step further here in challenging you know, everyone to think about why there is cloning issues nowadays. And the reason for that is because we're not going too deep. We're only on the surface level when we authenticate people by voice it's easy to clone somebody nowadays mm -hmm. because the cloning of the voice only understands or authenticates that person at maybe two levels deep but with our technology because gabby is listening to every single conversation and understanding who you truly are as a person the essence of your being it's very hard to imitate who you truly are so i'll give you an example <clears throat> if you're, you know, uh, if you were to call your mom and she picks up the phone and you, she were to use uh, words and phrases that you've never heard her say before, or her R's are dragging on and rolling maybe more than it typically does, uh, or she's yeah, pick up on that for sure, or she's long-winded versus uh, how she typically is, and maybe she's typically abrupt. Those are red flags in our heads that currently aren't being picked up by, you know, LLMs out there that, that are doing translation. So mm. when you talk about authentication and security, I would actually challenge us to really imagine a world where you go so deep, perhaps seven levels deep in authentication. Uh, I don't mean, you know, you have to put in your password seven times, but I mean as in it's authenticating you at almost a cellular level in a way. Does that make sense? Yeah. It does. I, mean, I mean, I don't know what the seven levels are, if you want to elucidate that for us. I think Dante <laughs> discussed the seven levels. That's another, that's another <laughs> whole bunch of levels. So let me ask you this question. So. I, I put your I put your technology in a satellite and I call Michael and he speaks Mandarin, I speak English. So when I'm speaking to him in English, he hears it in Mandarin, right? But in my voice and with my inflection, is that pretty much 
one of the technologies? Because I know you guys were talking about that on our on our pre-interview call. So is that one of the technologies? Okay, so that's one. The other one, and I don't know, I know you have this, this chip and you have your quantum, but your chip is much different or your, your hypothesis is much different than everybody else. Are you allowed to talk about that? Because to me, that's the real news about what part of what your company does about the room temperature. Can you go into that at all? Or is that all we can say is that you've come up with something that nobody else has, room temperature, quantum computing, that's it. Um, actually, and uh, disappeared. There you go. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get yeah, my power line. Notes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the attorney sitting next to him saying Can't talk about this. <laughs> so, uh what i what I, well a uh, very good point steve and uh you know we we've got some uh very picky uh intel ip attorneys uh, on our board now who are right. making sure that we don't divulge anything that it gives insight yeah. but what i can say is that uh many people have tried to tackle decoherence uh, in uh, quantum systems, and uh, there is, is a collection. Well, you gotta you gotta tell us what that is. I mean, you know, decoherence meaning that something falls out of a quantum state. Quantum That's state. correct. It, and the, the 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 photon does not persist in a single state. Uh, it persists at once in many states at one time. And what we're trying to figure out, uh, if you focus on a single photon, is uh, which direction that spin is. Uh, its magnitude and uh, the the vector really of that photon. Where is it? And uh, the problem with that is it doesn't then aggregate into a system such that if we think about a fermion system in the quantum world, uh, there are many participants that can uh, stimulate uh, various readings in a quantum system. For instance, if I get a uh, a potassium ion, a calcium ion, uh, and I put them together, and I've got them trapped in a magnetic bubble. The characteristics of those two ions can be represented by a qubit. Mm -hmm. Each of those ions need not necessarily be a qubit. And so in this conception, when there are individual systems that have varying spins on their fermions and we have a plurality of fermions participating in that system we're more concerned about decoherence of that system than we are on any single qubit because what we don't what what happens at room temperature is there's a lot of interference you know if you look at a like a a uh, plank black box problem right we have uh, no matter how much you cool these things down there's always stray electrons, stray magnetic fields. There's always something that interferes with these uh, individual qubits. But when you start aggregating them into systems mm -hmm. and you can represent a system as a qubit, suddenly the entire system becomes much easier to think about than, oh my God, have I trapped the photon long enough to be able to measure it? I, I can get photo detectors that'll tell me all that I need to know. And, and in fact, passive devices to do that. So uh, the, the, the real answer is uh, we think there is a different way to look at how to do quantum computing. Yes. And uh, these customer requirements force us into a frame of mind of using off the shelf devices to solve a customer problem right now. Yeah, you're saying, yeah, I mean, what's your, what's your, so the, the different, I mean, you lost me for part of that, but I think I got the gist of it, which is that you're using, you're using ions in a system to represent what would normally be represented by a single qubit, a quantum, a version of a quantum system that is much more delicate. And this system that you've developed is so not delicate that you can do it at room temperature. Right. And I took a page out of Seymour Cray's book, you know, many years ago, I had a great opportunity to sit with Seymour Cray. Who's that? And, uh, Seymour Cray is the uh, father of supercomputing. Oh, Cray computing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I don't think uh, most people Seymour, would know everybody knows Seymour, Michael. Come yeah, on, come on. Uncle Seymour. <laughs> come on. They'll know, uh, the, well, they should know the Cray computer if they, uh, if they right, were yeah. in the 90s, right? And so, uh, you know, he did, some, he did a lot of brilliant work. 
And I had the opportunity to sit with him on a couple of occasions. In fact, uh, when invited uh, to sit with him, I, I broke the speed limit every time to get there as fast as I could. That was the kind of uh, impression this man had in my life. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when we started looking at how to solve the problem for the customers that we have in front of us, uh, it seemed a natural that I should revisit uh, some of Seymour's early work. And in fact, one of our conversations he and I had directly in Colorado Springs uh, concerned a processor design uh, he had when I was one year old. Mm -hmm. And so it turns out that if, if we had researchers and engineers who paid more attention to what went on in engineering systems and design, uh, we might have more engineering systems and design in front of us to pick from. Well, that, that's what I was going to ask you is that why, why hasn't the market already done this? If, if that's been around, if this idea has been around, are, wh who are the competitors that are pursuing this kind of approach, this kind of technology? You know what? Let, I, gotta, I gotta answer that for Jim because he's not going to tout mm -hmm. himself. So I'm going to have to do it for him. Uh, the reason why we have the solution is because of Jim. Jim is one of those, as you can tell, I mean, you know, it's very hard to follow along with him because he's way ahead of everybody else. But this guy, if you don't know his background, uh, I'll, I'll yeah, tell you. Yeah, we don't know his background. We don't so know his background. Yeah, 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 nice to tell, yeah, nice to tell us. Background. So Jim was one of two people that decipher, deciphered the ancient, uh, sorry, I can't speak to it, ancient Sumerian and Mayan tablets. That's that's one, one thing he did in a little bit of his life. Uh, he was also one of the grandfathers of AI within telecommunications itself. So for example, mm -hmm. the voicemail and how it ends up in your phone today, he was actually responsible in there on ground level from day one doing that. Uh, and then on top of that, he was also the co-founder of the uh, military cybersecurity professionals as well for the U.S. He's done lots of work for the military here as well. Uh, I'm sure he'll be happy to tell you about it. But you know what's really interesting about Jim also is that his wife is actually, uh, he's, she's got something called synesthesia. And uh, she... Oh, all the senses mixed together. Right. where they actually see colors. When you look at black and white words, you and I see black and white words, they see colors. Right. And so uh, all these combined, all his entire history combined, it, this is how he came up with it. He's also just brilliant, you know. Uh, so he thinks of things that, that he puts together, you know, formulas and algorithms in ways that nobody ever does. And, you know, I, I want to mention, too, that the reason why nobody else has come up with it today is because they don't have that kind of a background that Jim has. This rare combination is what makes Jim so special. He's a snowflake. And not only that, uh, you know, I want to say, I want to mention also, in regards to, um, you know, everyone trying to tackle this quantum issue for... I don't even know how long now, decades, mm -hmm. you know, we've been trying to, to get at this. Isn't it time that we shift our point of view? Isn't it time that we shift into, you know, a whole different mentality and mindset that it's not about uh, the brute force, but it's all about how you piece together the pieces of nature um, and what nature is telling us. Yes. The nature has all the answers. That's that's really kind of all we can say about that. But take a page from nature because nature so, has all the answers already right in front of us. So your your quantum, your your AI, your quantum, your super AI is going to from what the information I've read and from what you guys have said, it's going to use less less power and it's going to run faster. So that's that. And then you said something earlier that so that's kind of the the for people that can't follow along because you know their iqs aren't in the thousands um that's what you're saying on that the other thing you said which was interesting you said you have customers so what are you doing for your customers or can you tell us what your customers what space they're in what they what they are you don't have to tell us who they are if you can't but what are you going to do for your customers like what are your customers asking you to do now and then my follow-up question to that is why doesn't anybody know about you 
because all these other AI companies that have nothing yeah. other than a guy who came from open AI or this AI, they're getting stupid money for not just him being a person. So I want to know why nobody getting, knows about Euro AI, but let's go getting, your customers into that. We're getting stupid money already. We don't, do we know uh, that? <laughs> we don't know. I, well, I'm assuming they're not, or they wouldn't be here, but who knows? You never know. Well, there's some money at the table. I mean, you know, yeah. we can't say. But you're not getting a billion dollars is what I'm saying. Like all these other companies well, I mean, that have like nothing are getting a billion dollars for air. You have something and no one's throwing a billion dollars at you. If they threw a billion dollars at them, we would know that, Michael. <laughs> so, so tell us who your what customers are coming to you right now, and then tell us why in your in your mind why you don't think anybody's throwing a billion dollars at you, or why they know about you, or why they should, right. or why so, they yeah, or why they should know about you or throw you a billion dollars. Let's talk about the potential of our technology here because we only we talk about, about no. Let's talk about your customers. Like you yeah. said, you had customers. You're, so what's exactly. that look like? So, you know, the potential is not just bringing it into homes, but really right. in order to bring it into homes, we have to step one, introduce it to enterprises first, right? Have our paying customers, enterprises say, yes, we love this. Let's go ahead. And I want to pay you for it. That's, that's step number one. And so to de-risk this technology for, you know, global consumers, we are now approaching call centers. That's our very first, you know, lowest hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, initially we actually didn't know who to target. Uh, you know, it was that that whole problem of product market fit, right? Who do we call? Um, yeah. And one of our Middle East partners was, was just so smart. He goes, well, you know, there's lots of call centers in this part of the world. Why don't I just give them a call? And the calls haven't stopped ever since. I mean, they are clamoring to <clears throat> get line uh and we now have a wait list because then so, you can have people from anywhere in the world to talk to anybody else in the world using your technology exactly and uh and it's instantaneous but, correct yes it is it's, it's like we're talking now it would be instantaneous correct correct okay so what's really interesting with discovered is their problem is a huge huge problem i mean first of all you know it's a $40 billion uh, industry. Uh, number two, about 35 to 50% of their agents are actually multilingual. And they hire at a clip of one agent per month. That is to find them, to train them, to get them to be able to speak the terminology. Uh, all that, five weeks to find one person. So if you're Home Depot and you're looking to hire you know, a team of 12 call centers, it'll take you over a year to put together. And so they're turning away about 30% of their business. They're paying their multilingual agents anywhere from two to seven times as much money. So for every thousand agents, we can actually save them uh, over three, $3.3 million. And that's just in savings. That's not even, you know, in opportunity costs. Um, and now what we've realized is they can actually collapse their, you know, regional uh, call centers into one and go locate this regional call center uh, into the lowest labor market. So if you wanted to, for example, shift it all the way to Africa, where it might be the lowest labor cost in the world, you can now do that because somebody that speaks Bantu can now speak Chinese or Japanese or, you know, Arabic. How do you know it's accurate? Oh, extensive testing, of course. Hmm. Yeah, we do a lot of testing on these things. It, it doesn't go out and it's not usable unless it's above 95% accurate. Okay. And how and, many and languages do you support now? How many we, users? No, how many, how many languages, languages do you support now? Ah, ah. Uh, they request the languages, all these call centers, they request the, uh, the languages. They all have a top most, you know, top three languages that they all want. So right. right now we're talking to, um, we have some LOIs on the table. We have excited parties. In fact, just yesterday we received a good news, great news. In fact, um, we have been talking telecoms this whole time, but as of yesterday, we now have a, uh, a, a national telecoms company. So what you this- National Telco working with you on this project. Yeah. Very exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, what this means is that we can now open up continents. We can open up nations. When we work with telcos, 
you're talking about an entire nation becoming multilingual and being able to communicate with anyone in the world. Hmm. I wonder what Michael Collins, uh, our frequent guest, would say about uh, the race we'll to the him. bottom. <laughs> We're going to ask him next week. We'll ask him. Yeah. It'll be very interesting. Him and Guy yeah. Standing. There are two economists that come well, on the show all the time. So, so my next question then is: This is this is very cool. It's all Star Trek and 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 you know Star Wars stuff, which is neat. So you have all of this. These other companies have nothing. Why doesn't anybody know about you? Well, for the very reason that room temperature quantum, I mean, that's leaps and bounds beyond what is possible today. I right. mean, quantum isn't even possible today. Then to talk about, you know, adding on a room temperature <laughs> requirement mm -hmm. on top of that. But your have... AI though too, like all of it, like yeah. nobody knows that you're, yeah. it seems that you're, you're very advanced in AI where other companies aren't. There's, you're according to like when we've talked off air, the patents you have, nobody has. So you guys are literally ahead of everybody. And that includes open AI, chat GBT, all of them, all these companies that are coming out going, look at, you're ahead of all of them by not just years, but by like decades. You so, call it, yeah. you call it, super, it? You get to the, yeah. Like you, you call it super AI right. and you're dismissing all these other versions of LLMs. So you're not right. doing LLMs obviously. So what is the, what is the key differentiator between your AI and all the other ones that are out there? Going to take that one, Cheryl? Of course. <laughs> um, when we think about uh, AI and we allow others to define what AI is on our behalf, it can often be misleading. Oh, it completely is. So many companies are saying they're AI and they're not, of course. Right. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, many people uh, gave up on the hard part and settled on second best, which is 80% accurate data modestly slow response time, high power consumption, high latency. That's not AI, that's a poor engineering solution. Hmm. In the way that I was raised, and, and you have to understand, uh, my mentors, right? My very first mentor worked with John Bardeen, who's a double Nobel Prize winner. He worked with him and he told me flat out, he says, I don't give a damn what you do in the rest of your life, Harlow. You must remember that whatever you build, it must be rock solid and fast as hell. And if you're wait, if you're wasting CPU cycles mm. to protect your rice bowl, then maybe you're not doing it right. And so that's that's sort of a message that has haunted me all of my career. I mean, it's a nice now, it's a nice thought. It's a great. I think it's a it's a great thought. Maybe we need more engineers thinking that way, in terms uh, of better engineering. So. Yeah, I think we do, because uh, the expectations of AI uh, that I had are quite different than what we see today. And, and I can say two words uh, that actually sum it up. One, LLMs are immutable. Once constructed, you have to rebuild them again. They are unfalsifiable, meaning I don't get a, a chance to challenge what's coming out of the LLM, I have to accept it as if it was some sort of apodectic truth. And that's not science, nor is that engineering. That's more like a religion. If I cannot falsify the information coming out with an alternative explanation, then it's not really information. And when I have an AI that can discern and hold both positions at the same time, one position which will falsify the other, then we have an opportunity to engage people in the dialogue to discuss whether or not it's really a part of our reality at all. I think you used the, or maybe we, we said the phrase last time uh, that, that I'm now coming back to me, cognitive AI. I mean, Instead of replicating just language, you're trying to replicate thought. That's or, correct. Or, or that's culture, correct. you know. I mean, that's a that's a very tall order, very tall order. But it sounds like if you've got uh, people working with you, you've got obviously. Are you in alpha, beta? Can people access this today, or have you sure. have you had big beta tests? 
No, no, we we don't want this in the hands of consumers until we de-risk this. And uh, we are the first customer that we're going to install this into is uh, end of next month. Actually, it's our very first call center. So we've been at this for uh, quite some time now and uh, we're just about ready. We're excited. We're, you know, we're going to put it out and see what happens. But, uh, you know, there's extensive testing that has to be done. Obviously, Uh, we're undergoing that right now. We're refining it. But by the end of next month, we should be ready to go. So where are you gonna, where are you gonna be and let's and and for the for the viewers you know for our listeners too I mean what do you what should our listeners you know do with this information what do you want them to go away with saying okay you've got this these these two technologies the quantum the 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 uh, the quantum I mean quantum AI you know this is what you're putting together cognitive AI with uh, room temperature quantum uh, what do they need to know? And uh, my follow-up would be, where do you want to be in 12 months then? So, okay, I'll, from my point of view here, um, what I really want people to realize and perk up to and really, uh, and really just absorb this and think about this for a second. In the future, all of humanity will be dependent on AI. Oh, yeah. Which AI do we trust? Which AI do we want to trust? The one that is uh, non-understanding of the essence of humanity, that is uh, taught on Excel spreadsheets and books and YouTube videos, which is not indicative of who we truly are, um, or do you trust an AI that understands the essence of humanity, understands how we make decisions, understands how we solve problems, what our problems are, what really matters to us, who really matters to us? All this is the personalized, the personalization side of things and the cognitive uh, technology that we have or the algorithm that we have that makes us so special because at the end of the day, you know, our competitors, they're going to put this, you know, AI into robots that are far stronger. They're already doing it. They're already doing it. Yes. That are far stronger than us. And so when you have a new species, when you're creating a new species, which is exactly what we're doing here, we're playing God. When we create this new species, uh, we got to make sure that this new species doesn't make decisions based on binary, you know, data or binary information. We got to make sure this new species understands who we truly are. Um, so that's, yep, go ahead. Earlier you said that, uh, earlier in the conversation, you said that it needs, to, that Gabby needs to, or Gabby will listen to somehow, <laughs> it'll somehow learn everything about you to to what create a digital twin is that the concept of right correct so, so you would so her oai is going to have a digital twin for every user basically correct correct um so if you can imagine you know all the phone calls that you're on if you had a secretary uh, that you hired and your you know task for a secretary was just literally to shadow you all day and learn everything about you from the conversations that you have your assistant would learn very quickly all about who you are. Um, and it's the same exact thing. It's listening to your conversations, understanding who you are so that it can then go be the extension of you uh, accurately and, and have an accurate representation of you, accurate way of the way you make your decisions. Um, that's what makes us all so special. Interesting. I mean, it's interesting because the what I... What I think of is there's there's a lot of sides to that. This the idea of everyone having a digital twin, basically owned by Hero AI. Um, you know, you, it could very quickly devolve into a dystopian view of thinking that well, who really owns the digital twin? Who could who could? I mean, you could once you have it, you can duplicate it, you could share it, you could study it, you could do anything you want to it, which. In a way, if you've seen the social network, they're already doing that with social networks. You know, they're already doing that on Facebook and Instagram and all the others. 
Um, but on the other hand, you know, if you what what what's what do you see as the positive side of digital twinning all of your users? Man, I just love your question to death right now, Mike. <laughs> um, because this is one of the biggest issues that we see today with you know, say, uh, ChatGPT or OpenAI. Uh, they first of all, it's it's very general, right? All the answers that we get from it is very generalized. When none of us are, all of us are, you know, uh, our own in individuals. So we're giving color to every single AI by do by hyper personalizing it. But you know, the question then boils down to security. Well, um, does Hero AI own these data essentially? or the AI? And the answer is no, we actually have a brand new model. It's a DAO model. And uh, our goal here is to do right by people, by humanity. And what we're doing is we're separating our data from our actual business side. And so that piece of the data will actually be owned by users like you and I. Mm. And you can actually from the beginning, yeah, from the beginning. I mean, there's a lot of there's been a lot of talk because all the social networks they they own the digital twin of each person and use it for advertising. So you're saying off the bat that you that the users would somehow own the digital twin from the beginning. Absolutely, there's no other way. There's absolutely no other way to go about this. And not only that, you'll actually be able to monetize the wisdom that you're contributing because there is going to be an aggregated uh, knowledge base, right? So mm -hmm. Mike, you are you know, brilliant in business. Steve, you are brilliant in M&A. Uh, maybe there's a lawyer that wants to contribute wisdom to the pot. And that allows you know uh, everyone across the globe to tap into this pot of wisdom. Now you can choose to contribute it for free, or you can choose to sell it. And there may be a one-click button for you to be able to purchase you know certain uh, little tidbits of knowledge from every single individual. Well, the, it gives new meaning to the knowledge economy, which I think we're already yeah. in in so many ways. I mean, we actually, I am a remote work coach, so to speak, with Bendicoot, as we saw in one of our last episodes. But uh, yeah, the knowledge economy, it gives it it gives it a kind of a different flavor. Um, Steven, what do you got? We got to wrap up in a little bit. So we should yeah, we got about five minutes left. So really oh. quick. So once again, answer this because you haven't yet. So why doesn't anybody know about you? You are <laughs> light years, you're literally decades ahead of everything that's out there. And no one knows who you are. You have literally yeah, well, two minutes we know to tell us. The show. <laughs> yeah, well, after we, the show, you will. But before the show, they don't. So why not? Why does anybody know about you? We weren't ready to come out yet. And now we're so out. We're out, out of the closet, closet. So We're speak. out. Okay, congratulations. Out. And right. we're, we're out. out. And we did You're it very on flamboyant. Entertainment. So. <laughs> All right. Very cool. Well, thank you so much. Come back when you have more. Or I know like a lot of it's under wraps still, but was when you come back, tell us more, maybe the beginning of the year, you can tell us where you are, what's going on, um, and maybe who your clients are by then um, and what's doing for them. It'd be that I think would be fascinating and, and where your technology has gone from where it is today in three months. Because there's a lot, the, there's a lot to unpack. There's a lot to yeah. unpack on a lot of different levels. Um, yeah. I wish you a lot of luck in uh, yeah. in, in that work because it's it's you're involving every. I mean, really, what you're talking about is a paradigm shift in the way people think about artificial intelligence and the way we interact with it at a, a governance level, if you want to call it that, at the at the business level, co commerce, uh, individual rights, digital identity. There's a lot there. So uh, it would be great to, I mean, if, if anything that I'd, I'd love to see more on your, your, the thoughts that we covered here, it'd be great to see more of that on your site so that people would see what Hero AI is, is representing right. and kind of ushering in um, as an organization. So Exactly, we, and we're working on that. Uh, we've had to keep stealth for a while, but yeah. you know, now we're, we're about to flip the switch, so. I'm going to say, apparently the stealth is over, you're here. And all yeah. the fans are going to watch this. Well, good so luck. Yeah. Well, we would love to have you back. would love to have yeah. you back to talk further about these, these topics in, in more detail. Oh, 
Thank, well, thank you. you so much, both Thanks of for you. Having us. And for you guys, Hero AI, if you want to look them up, it's HeroAI.com. Uh, if you can't figure it out, reach us at the show. We'll get it to you. And we're going to keep these guys gone. We're going to run a commercial, and we're going to do a real quick a lost and found for everybody. Awesome. Thank you guys for being here. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Thank you all very much. Get the freedom and the flexibility of remote work in the lucrative tech industry. Bend your life around, around the world. Bendicoot is the premier course and community for thriving in a remote tech career. Join the revolution today. Bendicoot.com, official partner of the Lost Dollar Business Club. All really right. Quick, before we go to Lost and Found, and I've yes. done this thing. The really cool thing I thought with their technology, um, because off air we've talked in much detail, is the fact that I can pick up my phone and talk to anybody in the world in English and they understand me in their language. I thought that right. to me is the coolest. That's the coolest thing. Not a translation sense, but a cultural sense. So that's, I, right. I'd I like. Mean, well, yeah, I talked. They, yeah. I saw the demo they have um, and they used a, a, a preacher and they and they translated into a whole bunch of languages. And when he speaks, I did the first in English and then like Japanese and Pat, uh, the whole of yeah. it. And you hear his voice in their language with his inflections. And I thought that was amazing. So I was like, that's very cool. So yeah, so I, I they're like years ahead. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. Yeah, so. and they'll be back on the show. That'd be great. I, yeah, they'll come back. All right, let's do Lost and Found. I have a let's real funny one from yeah. The Economist again. Here Ever we go. wonder how millions vanish into thin air or how a single dollar can make all the difference? Join us on Lost and Found, where we dive into the wild world of financial mysteries. From misplaced fortunes to unexpected windfalls, we unravel the stories of people, companies, organizations, and even governments who've lost and found millions. Lost and Found, because every dollar has a story. Okay, here you go. Mike. Apparently, um, you first, you have one? apparently, yeah, I got one. I mean, apparently every password has a story too, because Apple just fixed a bug in their last right. iOS release that right. is visually impaired. It reads what's on your screen. Well, it'll shout your passwords too. So it was shouting people's passwords to everyone around them That's as they awesome. were using the device. Uh, now they fixed that bug. No problem. Get the update. That's that's what or, I'm or if you want just to let your password be shouted can you imagine if you have a dirty password and it's like like me like all my passwords are dirty like i <laughs> i would be thrown out of any place if they heard them um the funny there was a story in the economist you know it's either i read 1834 right. i read the economist and all but the economist there's a new book coming out and research that says and I, the reason it struck me funny is because i don't care Abraham Lincoln, the president of the United States, was possibly gay. Now I'm thinking to myself, this is almost <laughs> 200 years ago. Who cares? But because of some letters, they're saying he might have been gay. And now there's a book that's going to break it down. And I'm like, I don't care. Wow. <laughs> I just thought it was funny. It was one of yeah, those. That's, that's hilarious. That's hilarious. That's well, I guess we're gonna we're gonna go back in time and research everybody and find out. You know, we're gonna out we're gonna out people in the past. That they're, they're dead and they can't, they can't, whatchamacallit, they can't defend themselves. Well, just so we're on the record, so a couple hundred years from now when they're watching this, straight as an arrow, sorry. Um, <laughs> for, the record, for, the record. for the record. Hey, guys, thanks for watching. Michael's got to go. I've got to go. Don't forget, every Saturday morning you can catch us here or on the podcast. We have Michael Collins next week, if I'm not mistaken, guys standing the week after. If you guys have any other guests you want us to bring, let us know. Thank you all for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and like. Mike, have a great weekend. All right. Cheers, everybody.